we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco blazing across the land, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, the planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves, and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophonous cavalcade of conversation. What's shaking out there? Tonight seems like a perfect opportunity to take a break from the hustle, bustle, buy and spend, run around like a crazy person, hyperactivity of the holiday season, kick back, sip a beverage, ponder not only the universe, but the year that's just about done. 2022 went by in a blur, didn't it? But tonight we take stock of some of what's unfolded this year, try to make some guesses about what comes next, but mainly in the coast to coast vein, that is. What's next for our strange little slice of the cosmos, our collective grasp on reality? This week marks five years since the world of UFOs changed forever. Back on December 17, 2017, the print edition of the New York Times revealed that contrary to all the propaganda that's been force-fed to the public about UFOs over decades, that the Pentagon had, in fact, been studying the subject in secrecy all along. The Times told about a program called ATIP, once headed by Lou Elizondo, with a $22 million secured by Nevada's senior Senator Harry Reid, my pal. They got a few things wrong in that story, but the essence of that piece was correct and true. After all the denials and dismissals and public poo-pooing by defense folks and presidents about UFO incidents and cases, they really had been looking at this behind closed doors all along, and wow, some of what they'd been studying was truly anomalous and unexplained. Specifically, the Tic Tac case. That was the example they used in that New York Times piece that really sold the story. That one that toyed, that object that toyed with our our best fighter planes and messed with our best aviators from the USS Nimitz group. There was video that was released, uh, the testimony of Black Aces pilot Dave Fravor, statements from Senator Reid about the importance of the work that was being done, acknowledgement from Robert Bigelow that his company here in Las Vegas had the contract to do the digging Everything changed. Uh, Other media started digging in and reporting about UFOs, too. Suddenly, Congress became interested, cautiously at first, you know, behind closed doors, hearing testimony from aviators and others, then publicly. And before you knew it, we had an acknowledged UFO investigation, uh, the UAP Task Force. They didn't call it UFOs, called it UAP, gave it a new moniker there. This UAP Task Force went to work, and soon we started hearing about cases they were investigating. And then this year, the first public hearing in front of Congress, first public hearing in like half a century, and we heard about a new program that was dubbed AIMSOG. That was the name for a while. Then they reshuffled it, gave it a new name, Arrow, or new acronym, that is. And now here we are awaiting yet another report to Congress that was due on Halloween. So where is it? And what will it contain once it gets released, assuming the public ever gets to see it? So much has changed in five years, and there are more more changes, major changes, just this year alone, with with promises of big stuff to come, Uh, whistleblowers who are supposedly getting ready to step forward, protected witnesses 
protected by legislation that's just about to be signed into law by the president. Uh, we're hearing about more reports from military folks and intelligence agencies. Where is all this going to lead? It's exciting times. It's exciting stuff, as irritating as it might be once in a while. Joining me tonight are uh, two of the best UFO journalists in the world. Bryce Zabel, longtime CNN correspondent, a writer, a co-host of Need to Know, which is a YouTube video podcast that debuted one year ago. Happy anniversary, Bryce. Bryce's partner in that endeavor is a multi-award winning national correspondent from Australia, Ross Coltart, who's broken numerous major UFO stories all over the world over the past five years, along with a best-selling book. Uh, both of these guys have been on the show earlier this year, and I promised I'd have them back to help make sense of 22 at the end of the year. And, um, well, there's so much to cover. We're going to be getting to that in just a few minutes. You know, my first program, my first Coast program of this year started with a guest I've come to know really well. He's had a great career as a hard news reporter for a national network. Then he became a muckety-muck in television, wrote these scripted programs, including the excellent Dark Skies drama on NBC. A lot of you will remember that. He's written extensively about UFOs, especially over the past five years, and is the co-host of Need to Know, an excellent podcast carried on YouTube, co-hosted by his friend and colleague, Ross Coltart. Uh, Bryce Zabel is the, the, the first host, and Ross is the second host. I don't know if they'd agree with that order or not. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> Ross is uh, one of the best known and most honored journalists in Australia. He's broken numerous big stories around the world on UFO developments and programs and secrets in this country and his con- home country and others. Uh, Ross was here on the show a couple months ago. I promised him we'd bring him back uh, to be with Bryce to review the whole year and more, and that time has come. Gentlemen, great to have you here. Can't wait to get going. Good hey, George, George it's great, uh, great to be with you. I, you know, I don't know about the co-host thing. I always think of Ross as the uh, Johnny Carson of Need to Know, and I'm <laughs> the Ed McMahon. But, uh, yeah, happy to be here, caffeinated, ready to go. Excellent. Uh, you I know, just, the only I just call Bryce boss. <laughs> <laughs> the only other guy I wish was with us was would be my pal Jeremy Corbell, but he's working on a secret project at home tonight, and so. But he sends his regards to you guys. I, I want to start with some current events. A little press gaggle, what some might call a media gathering, an informal briefing held by the Department of Defense to talk about UFOs, UAP, and needless to say, the three of us were not invited. Not that I would ever expect to be, but if I I'd be dishonest if it didn't say it bothered me that uh, that none of us, three of us, were considered. Uh, Ross, I want to start with you. Let me give me your take when you heard that this event was happening, um, that you were not asked, you didn't know who was asked, you didn't know what the structure was. What did you think? Oh, look, George, it's got the whole whiff of, as you know, we're waiting for this UAP report that is statutorily required by your Congress to be tabled in the Congress. It's long overdue, should have been in by the end of October. And I think that what that press conference was, was a clear attempt to control the narrative before that report hits the pages. I reckon what you'll see is that report gets dumped just before Christmas when everybody's winding down for the year, putting their feet in front of the fire, warming up the mulled wine. There's just no interest at that time of the year in covering hard news stories. And it's a deliberate attempt, I believe, a disingenuous attempt by the Pentagon to try to minimise public interest in what I suspect will be an acutely interesting UAP report to Congress. Uh, Same question to you, Bryce. The fact that it happened on the very same day, the five-year anniversary of that New York Times story, was that odd? Is that uh, what did you make of that? Well, you know, it's a coincidence, and uh, it it depends on how you look at coincidences. I think they couldn't possibly have missed their uh, awareness that that it was an important day, and I, I certainly think it is an important day, and I think history will record that. As for what they actually talked about there. Uh, I thought it was disappointing in, in a lot of ways, but I was uh, encouraged only in one way, that they were having it. And I think they should have more of these. Uh, I think more people should be invited, and I think the questions should get tougher, and uh, and people should be pressed for real answers. The only thing I uh, questioned, though, is I, I think they did say in this uh, transcript, I'm, I'm trying to find it right now. I can't. Maybe you guys have read it. Maybe you can remember. But I thought that somebody there said – that the uh, the report that was due on October 31st would be coming out very soon. Do you do you guys remember that as well? Yeah, that that is the case. Yeah, they do say that. They'll say it comes out very soon. 
the funny thing about it is they, they had enough information about it right back even a few weeks ago now to brief Julian Barnes of the New York Times right. about it. And for some obscure reason, the public are being kept in the dark right up to the very busiest time of the holiday season. I, I just don't think I'm, – I'm, I'm afraid we have to call this for what this is, George. It's, a, it's an attempt to try to minimise public interest and to control the narrative. And, and if to follow on from what Bryce has been saying – in the actual course of the uh, press conference, I was really struck by how Ron Moultrie, the Under Secretary for uh, Defence, for uh, Intelligence and Security, Ron Moultrie basically kept on talking over Sean Kirkpatrick, who's nominally the boss of the Arrow, the UFO UAP investigation group inside the Pentagon. And so any time a curly question was asked, especially by our chum, um, Christopher Sharp, for example, from the Liberation Times Daily Mail. Chris Sharp asked about whether or not there was any detection of anomalous objects in space. Sean Kirkpatrick's just about to answer. We're all leaning on the edge of our seats. And then Ron Moultrie leans in and says, oh, sources, means and methods. We can't talk about that. I'm sorry. You know, to discuss that would be to reveal our sources, means and methods. What a load of cogswallop. <laughs> And I was disappointed that some journo didn't lean in there and say, as you should at a press conference, oh, come on, why would it prejudice sources, means and methods to acknowledge what I do know is the case because it's coming in through Pine Gap here in Australia, the joint facility here in Australia. They are seeing anomalous objects in space. Why couldn't that be acknowledged? I want to remind our listeners that Ron Moultrie, if any of you watched that UFO public hearing before Congress back in uh, the, the summertime, Moultrie was the DOD guy who sort of took control of that meeting, too. And uh, and what he did was he sort of set the stage for that hearing by saying, hey, you know, I was a big Star Trek fan. He didn't say Star oh. Trek, but I was a real sci-fi fan as a kid. And I might have even worn costumes to parties and stuff, yuckety yuck, uh, equating UFOs with sci-fi, uh, you know, the, uh, showing pretty much his colors right off the bat. It was a very subtle thing, but it bothered me. Oh, Bryce? George, it, it, it made Ross and myself just want to tear our fists out of the ceiling. I mean, listening to the May 17th, uh, you know, public hearing, which was a congressional hearing, the first in 54 years, if I'm not mistaken. So on that regard, it was very good. But watching it was such a disappointment. And I have to say, Ron Moultrie has become... Uh, my, the new bane of my existence. I just, I, I, it's, it's like fingers on a chalkboard when I have to listen to this guy. But I'll tell you one thing, guys, which I thought was kind of interesting. As I was uh, listening to that and also reading through this transcript, I thought I was getting nostalgic for the days of Blue Book when there was just one group that was investigating UFOs and you could <laughs> pronounce it because um, I just wrote this down from memory, but we've had OSAF, ATIP, Arrow currently, AIMSOG, the UAP task force, the UAP JPO, uh, you know, and it, it's just you got to ask yourself, why would someone try to confuse what the investigation's uh, name of the even office is? I don't I don't get it. Something I agree with Ross. Something is going on in terms of pushback. Uh, it's not exactly clear, but uh, but it's not good. Uh, Ross mentioned the name Julian Barnes. I don't know Julian Barnes. I know of him now because of this piece that came out in the New York Times almost two months ago. It was a debunking effort. It was a what you call a pre-bunking effort. It was meant to throw cold water on this UAP report before it was written. Now, they, the defense department has told us it, it hasn't been written. Maybe it's finished by now and they're they're just about done with it. But when he wrote that story, quoting unnamed sources, the report was not finished. It had not been written. It was still collecting information, yet they tried to debunk it. And, of course, Julian Barnes is one of the journalists that was invited to this event, and he asked what I would think to be the key question, what they hoped the headline would be. Have you found any evidence of space aliens? And, and of course, they, you know, the Pentagon was only too happy to answer that. No, we don't have any evidence of space aliens. I, wanna, I don't know what that evidence would be, but I suspect that that is the headline that they wanted. And a couple of media outlets, The Drive was one that bid on it and ran with it. Uh, Ross, your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's exactly what they were trying to do, George. It was all about trying to control the narrative to make sure that the message that 
they want is out there before the report that they have to begrudgingly provide to Congress is actually disclosed to Congress. And I, I just want to echo a few of the answers that came through in that press briefing, because even though most of the questions were pretty lame and tame, for example, Oren Lieberman from CNN, he, he asked about whether there was any indication that these cases or the data that they've gathered is in any way indicative of something that's a threat to US national security or to a military facility or personnel? And do you have any reason to believe that from what you've looked at so far? And Sean Kirkpatrick answered truthfully, yes. And and then <laughs> Ron Moultrie, God bless him, he just runs in quickly and basically says, now just to clarify, we're still trying to resolve some of these places and they probably still could be characterized as civilian balloons. It's the old balloon story again. The, the one thing I did notice is that Ron Moultrie didn't try and crank out that tired old Chinese drone yarn that he pulled back in May in the congressional briefing, where he was suggesting that all of the objects that Jeremy uh, Corbell broke the story about in his brilliant report about videos of strange objects hovering over US Navy ships around 2019, um, there was no more talk from Ron Moultrie, the Under Secretary of Defence for Intelligence and Security, about Chinese drones. Yes, some of these may be drones. Yes, some of these objects may be explained as drones. But on the record, the Pentagon admitted to the media, and this was the key takeaway, this is a threat to national security mm. because any unauthorised system in the airspace is deemed a threat to safety. And yeah, so, I thought, yeah, good point. I, I think there was some good stuff to come admission. out of this. Yeah, go ahead. No, go that's ahead. the key admission. And hey. I, I think we need to keep on reminding ourselves, when you were doing your summary at the head of the show, George, I was thinking, gosh, we have come a long way in five years. Five years ago, when I tried to sell a story to my television program that, you know, UFOs are potentially real, that there is a phenomena that even the Pentagon is acknowledging as real, I would have been laughed out of the newsroom. Now, mercifully, I can say that the TV network that I work with here in Australia, they're enthusiastic for UAP. Uh, before we leave this topic about this event that was held on, on Friday, I, I want to get, uh, Bryce, I want to get you to weigh back in on it, but I, I do want to make this comment. There were some good reporters there. You know, I think probably three of us are ticked off that we weren't even considered for it. I would know, I'd be very surprised if I would ever be invited to something like that because I'm not, I'm not considered a good friend of the Pentagon on, on the UFO issue. But uh, they did have some good people there. Brian Bender, Chris Sharp, you mentioned Owen from CNN. Who, and there's some good stories came out of it. They may have wanted a headline that said, no evidence of space aliens. What they got was, like, The Guardian had a really good piece. Associated Press had one, too, that uh, basically said there are hundreds of new cases that came in. They're not explained. And then there was some discussion of crash retrievals. You know, they I think they wanted that to be shut down, but the answer was, we're looking into it. We're trying to figure out through all the compartmentalized programs whether there's anything to it, which that's not a headline I would think that they'd want to have. Uh, Bryce, your take on on that event and, and uh, future events, I guess you'd have to agree that everybody should be invited, right? Well, I mean, as many as they can get into the room. But, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with what you just said. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we were talking about how the Department of Defense would like to control the narrative. But what you were just talking about, George, sort of proves that that's a uh, false hope. Because once people start asking questions, then one door after another starts getting opened. And controlling the narratives never has worked. I mean, think about it. Nixon tried to control the, narr the, the narrative on Watergate, uh, Reagan on I Iran country, Clinton with Monica. But you know what? Uh, it all came out anyway. We may be entering a place where we're, we're close to that. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on two quick things that you guys talked about in the last segment. Uh, we were talking about how things have changed since 2017. And uh, they certainly have, but the biggest one for me and the best and simplest way I can explain it is pre-2017, when I started talking about UFOs with friends and family, they all kind of looked at me funny and treated me like the drunk uncle at the wedding. And uh, post-2017, uh, they ask me questions. They say, what do you know about this? I saw something on the news. I know you're into this. Please explain it to me. So that's a big change. And then the final thing I just wanted to bring up, this Chinese drone thing, the reason it's been abandoned is pretty simple. Or it's not totally abandoned, by the way. But the reason it needs to be abandoned is 
if there are Chinese drones out there doing what these UAP are reported to be doing, up to you know 10,000 miles an hour, transmedium from space to atmosphere to uh, sea, uh, that's this thing's been going on for 75 years. There were not Chinese drones in 1947 or 1950s or 1960s. That, that didn't exist. So what would explain the same level of observation back then? And so I think that's why that dog won't hunt much longer. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I was happy to see this. I was happy to see some of those reporters that you talked about being there. They're good reporters, and good reporters uh, don't take the spin that's dished out to them. They ask questions, and they come up with independent conclusions like you do, like Ross does, and like I do, and, and hopefully many more will be doing that in the future. You know, it's, it's, I think, an indication that good journalism still exists and good journalism can still change the world, can change things. And I know, you know, at least in this country, Ross, uh, everyone loves to hate the media, the press. Uh, our, uh, uh, our profession is vilified by the right and the left. Uh, I don't know if that's true in Australia now, but uh, it, it, the, the New York Times story changed the world, even though it wasn't 100 percent accurate. It, it allowed, in essence, allowed other media to take this seriously and start digging into it. And then you had 60 Minutes and, and The Washington Post and, and other media organizations, CNN, MSNBC, Fox in a big way. Fox News in a big way has gone after it. And it has changed the world. It allowed members of Congress to go ahead and admit that they're interested in this instead of uh, talking about it only behind closed doors. Ross, your take? I agree. I I think the interesting thing, the lesson for Congress, is that they ignore this issue at their peril. Uh, I mean, even in my home country here in Australia, I'm I'm stopped frequently now on the street by people who listen to our podcast, Need to Know Dot Today, and they they basically come in and say, look, you know, I really like the stories that you're doing on Channel 7. There's a real interest and an engagement. But I have to admit, George, I'm still very disappointed by the level of media engagement and the kind of the default mockery. I was really shocked that a great paper like the New York Times, I've done stories with the New York Times, and I've seen how much they verify and check sources. But if you're a senior national correspondent, like, for example, Julian Barnes, and you're a national security correspondent and you're called into the Pentagon for a quiet briefing with the very senior officials who no doubt briefed him. I suspect Ron Moultrie was one of them. Um, you know, if you're given that kind of briefing, you don't, uh, as we would say impolitely in Australia, you, you don't pee on your source. You, you basically do the right thing by them. And, and the difficulty is that for national security correspondents, they're compromised on this issue because, as we all know, there's been a long cover-up. The cover-up is a matter of public record. The Pentagon has been misleading, disingenuous, actively sought to suppress public interest and awareness of the UAP issue. And, Bryce, with your knowledge of Hollywood, you know, there's been an active attempt through movies and through the retelling of stories to try to suppress what is actually going on inside the government. Because at the same time that we're all being fed a public narrative that that UAPs are easily explained prosaically, that they're probably weather balloons, probably a natural phenomenon, we now know behind the scenes they never stopped investigating. And my worry is, is that we're being fed a very deliberate, controlled narrative by the Pentagon, and we can't let them... Stick to this. We need to hold their feet to the fire. I'm genuinely concerned that senators like Gillibrand, Senator Gillibrand of New York, um, the Marco Rubio, the Republican senator from Florida, you know, what, what, why on earth aren't these people out there stating their concerns that the UAP report is not yet with the Congress, is not yet publicly available? This is the sort of stuff where we really need to hold their feet to the fire. This battle is not over, and the public out there, people listening, they need to write to their congressmen and their congresswomen and their congressional representatives and say this issue matters, because otherwise it will be put back in a box for another 70 years. You know, that story, that New York Times story by Julian Barnes, the pre-bunking story that tried to throw cold water on the pending UIP report, is a reminder of what the New York Times has done since the early 1960s, which is crap all over the UFO subject. It's incredibly hostile, overtly hostile, 
along with the Washington Post and most of the big newspapers, uh, they have been as well. The fact that Leslie Kane, that Ralph Blumenthal, Helene Cooper were able to get that story on, get it past their editors and get it in, even though it had some some problems and some some pieces that were missing. Uh, it's it's an astonishing thing for them to have done it because it changed the media landscape. Uh, uh, Bryce, your thoughts? Hey, George, uh, you know, we're talking about journalism here and, and uh, this narrative. I think one of the problems we have is that journalists themselves are part of the spin anti-UAP. We've touched on it here, but let me give you an example that strikes close to your heart, I think. Senator Harry Reid died a year ago, basically, December 28th of last year. And one of the things Ross and I did in one of our very first shows is we went through all the news coverage of Harry Reid's obituaries. And I don't recall finding a single one at the time. Maybe there was one. Mine. But, yes. Well, yes. But, of course, you actually know what you're talking about <laughs> on that. Everyone else managed to write uh, about Harry Reid's life and career and not mention the very, very important thing that not only was he helpful in, in uh, investigating UAP, but he talked to you about it. It was something that he was interested in to his dying days, and he was passionate about it, and yet they didn't mention that. Now, why is that? What, if, a, if a famous person who passes away spends his years out of office uh, interested in a single issue like that, why would that not be part of the story? And it's because those journalists who were in charge of writing that obituary probably didn't even know. And if they did know, they felt the stigma would attach to them if they started writing about it. So they gave it a pass. And I think those days we have to put in our past very quickly. Yeah, Senator Reid uh, came to believe and uh, came to appreciate that the, the UFO story, the developments, uh, were, in fact, an important leg of his legacy. It was an important part of his career as a politician. I think he it took a while for that to sink in, but he certainly acknowledged it before he passed on. I, I talked to him about it many times. And, it, of course, he and I had a secret conversation about UFOs for more than 30 years and if it had not been for what he did, we wouldn't be having this conversation. There would have been no New York Times story. There would have been no ATIP program, no OSAP program, no UAP task force. Or if they had been, it would have been some other name and we might not have ever heard about it. You know? Think about what you just said, though. Here's a, a senator, the majority leader, who's had a three-decade-long conversation with you about the topic of UFOs. And it's not a part of of looking yeah. back over his life and trying to assess what his life and career meant. It's, it's madness. And, uh, and, and that says a lot about where we are today. It, the reason progress is slow and we keep thinking things are being put back in the box is because there are people that are trying to do that. Whether they're going to win or not, I think is doubtful. Uh, but, but it doesn't mean they can't slow down the, the role for, for, a little, for a few more years. I want to congratulate you guys again, a, a year of doing the Need to Know podcast. There, there is great stuff. I hope people will check it out. They could, you know, review, watch them all. There's 25 of them that you've done. And in the most recent one you did, you reviewed sort of some of the progress that's happened. And I thought one of the most interesting parts to me was all the people who have come out and said something about UFOs, the prominent people, uh, directors of national intelligence, former CIA head, the, uh, um, you know, uh, Presidents, you know, President Obama, I, I've got headlines that I saved from back when he was in the White House where they they dumped all over it. They were asked directly, you know, by the public, hey, what, what get to the bottom of this? What's going on? And they threw cold water on it, saying there is no evidence of any space aliens. You know, move along, folks. Nothing to see here. President Obama's come a long way. He's changed. In fact, I, I was I got a text from Tom DeLong, my friend Tom DeLong, two days ago saying, he sent me this note about Obama being involved in a production movie of a movie about Betty and Barney Hill. Now that is quite an about face. <laughs> and I'm sure when I saw it, I thought, man, this is going to drive my friend Bryce Zabel up the wall yeah. because I, well, <laughs> I, I'm not going to brief about uh, Obama's uh, interest. I'm glad to see uh, president Obama taking a more active interest in this topic. It's, it's absolutely uh important and it's it's interesting to me that that after a lot of uh, uh comments in the past where he's kind of 
put down the whole UAP topic. He now seems to be addressing it. And as you point out, I can't really speak for what uh, the Obama production company is doing. All I know is from what I read is they're trying to do a Betty and Barney Hill movie, which, of course, I'm doing myself. So there's that. Well, I knew that's what I meant is that you had been working on this and hoped to get something in production for a lot of years. So I thought, oh, man, here comes Obama stealing Bryce's. Rice's project out from under him. Well, but. I don't think it, you know. I don't look at it that way, George. I'm I'm pretty confident and sanguine about this thing. It's a it's a free country. People uh, in Hollywood pursue projects all the time. I, I don't need to remind anybody that often uh, projects that are th- about the same thing will be released at the same time. I mean, think about Armageddon and Deep Impact coming out in the same right. year and same season. Uh, you know, I, I'm not worried about it. I've got the rights to the captured book. Uh, that was written by Kathleen Martin and Stanton Friedman. And that tells about the, the life and times of Betty and Barney. And, and it's important to me that uh, I have that uh, under option. And also, I've done my own independent investigations into it and learned some new things. So, you know, as I, I think as the Obamas sit with this a while, I'm fairly sure they're going to come to the same conclusion that I did, which is this isn't the kind of story you want to do without the family side of things. And that means going out and getting the rights. So that's what I've done. And uh, I I, I just think um, it's not a problem uh, because either they're going to have to go get the rights, in which case they're going to have to talk to us, or they're not. And I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to continue to make uh, the the film that we want to make captured. And uh, we've uh, we've had offers. We turned one offer down. We're in conversations with other people, and uh, we've got international interests. And it ain't over till it's over. So, you know, let it go on. I I mentioned about Ross and the Need to Know episode that you guys bring up a couple of names. Uh, Clapper, the former DNI, Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, another one. Who Both of those guys have come out with what we would previously have considered alarming statements about UFOs. Uh, uh, current DNI, Avril Haynes. You must have had those kinds of heart-to-heart, off-the-record conversations with people at that level over the years. And must be some of you must be like a kid at Christmas in that in that they're now saying these things on the record on camera. That's the amazing thing about it, George. There is this cognitive dissonance between what I'm being told privately by sometimes quite senior people, including in my own government, but also in yours in the American government and in the British and French governments. There's an acknowledgement, just a flat, simple acknowledgement that this phenomenon is a mystery. It's real. It's technology. It's craft. It's not some natural phenomenon that can be easily dismissed. And I I do think, you know, it's funny, just to echo what you and Bryce have both been saying, there does need to be, I think, on this fifth anniversary, a tribute paid to the New York Times and that team, Ralph Blumenthal, Leslie Kane, uh, Helene Cooper, for just doing that bloody story, because it really did. It put things on the map. And I'm, I'm, I am aware that, that there is a, a pushback happening. I, I'm being warned by my own sources that there is a very determined pushback, that the view has been taken by some in the Pentagon and the intelligence community that, yes, OK, the Congress is demanding that we provide them with this information, but we're going to be as tough and as obdurate as possible and as uncooperative as possible, and we're going to try and use all the classic spin cards that we can use, such as pre-release briefings to select media, to try to minimise the coverage that this issue gets. And frankly, mate, it's not going to work because the level of public interest is enormous. People now know that the the jack is out of the box and um, you can't put it back in the box. And yes, we've got all these senior officials and and, and the Pentagon itself. I mean, the, the admissions that they made that these videos of unidentified aerial phenomena are real. There's a mystery they cannot explain. And that, for the most powerful nation on the planet, You know, with all the technology, all of the sensor technology that the U.S. and its allies, like Australia, operate not only in the atmosphere but underwater and in the orbit, the fact that we don't know, supposedly, what these anomalous phenomena are that are displaying technological abilities light years ahead of human science 
We were talking in the first hour with my guests, uh, Bryce and Ross, about pushback. And I can tell you that that is real. And it, that it, but it also it works both ways. There is pushback, I think, within the Pentagon by some who uh, want to diminish public interest, congressional interest, media interest. Uh, oh, we can explain those cases. You just got to give us enough time. You know, but I can tell you that there's pushback, too, as inquiries are made about crash retrievals, uh, metamaterials, craft bodies, things of that sort that I want to t- touch on in this hour. Uh, I think there's probably significant opposition to any of that stuff seeing the light of day ever. But I can also tell you with a degree of certainty that there is pushback from some of the professionals inside the Pentagon who were part of the earlier investigations, OSAP, ATIP, the UAP task force. They don't want their work to be diminished. They don't want someone to come along and with a wave of a hand say, these cases, July 2019 off the West Coast, those are just Chinese drones. And they're, they have pushed back to that. When they heard that that is what was underway, they pushed back and defended their work in some pretty heated closed-door briefings. That's my understanding. Ross, I want to take, get your take on where things might go, what you expect from this next UAP report, and whether you are pessimistic or optimistic in general. I'm very pessimistic, to be honest, George, and I try not to be. My natural disposition is to be optimistic, but um, uh, I'm hearing, I mean, the the thing that worries me is, like you, I'm talking to people who are thinking about coming forward as whistleblowers. And the message that they've got from the Congress is that key sections of the NDAA, the National Defence Authorisation Act, reforms about the UAP issue have been watered down before they were approved by the Congress, notably the the fact that uh, there was going to be independent oversight by the um, Inspector General. We were going to have a, a, a kind of an objective party overlooking whether or not whistleblowers were being fairly treated by the, by the RO, the UAP task force. And also they've removed the, the civil right of, um, uh, of litigation against uh, reprisals. So anyway, uh, anybody who was a whistleblower who suffered reprisals for speaking out would have had a civil right of, um, uh, to, to fight back against that reprisal. But that's been removed. And so I, I do worry that, that there's been a, an attempt in the Congress to try to fight back and, and water down these proposals. And my concern is to make sure that people feel free to come forward. And I, I had a conversation recently with somebody who, who told me of a, a shocking incident. Um, it's an allegation that they saw a helicopter brought down by or in an incident involving a UFO. And they're a direct witness to that incident. They want to come forward to the Congress. They want to tell the Congress what they saw. Now, what do they do? At the moment, we're waiting for the president to ratify the legislation, the NDAA laws, which will basically give them some degree of protection. But are they hearing acclamation from the Congress that this is a primary issue that they're concerned about? No, they're not. I don't think there's been any spokesperson from the Congress, any any congressperson speaking since the May 15th hearings. We've had our token public hearing, and it's gone away. And all of these uh, these uh, members of the Congress, um, Adam Schiff, who was making a loud noise about it last year, um, uh, Mark you know, you know, Rubio, uh, Gillibrand, they've all gone very, very quiet. The big question in the minds of the people who are thinking about coming forward is why? Why have they gone quiet? What's been said behind the scenes? And um, I I balance that with the fact that I'm also hearing that there may well have been private hearings where people have spoken privately to the Congress, which brings us to the other issue, which is even if information is disclosed to the Congress, how much are we going to be told? And I don't think we're going to be told a lot. If there are retrieved craft, which is not an impossible possibility, seeing it's featured in the pages of the the New York Times itself. If there are retrieved non-human technologies that are in the possession of the U.S. government or aerospace private entities that are holding those on behalf of the U.S. government in order to evade oversight, are we going to be told about it? I don't think we ever will be. Yeah, I I have my questions as well. Bryce, if you are CEO of a big aerospace company and you'd been given this stuff, uh, military passed it on to you to sort of stash it and hide it and maybe analyze it 50 years ago, you had this amazing technology that the whole world is interested in. Would you just give it back? 
I wouldn't. No, no, I don't. I, I, I don't think I would, and I don't think uh, the, the, the people that had it would do that. But uh, I, I look. There's a lot of different ways to look at this thing. Uh, Ross, by the way, plays the pessimist on Need to Know, and I play the optimist, uh, <laughs> I, I, which is ironic because. I, I get depressed about the thing as much as anybody. I do think we need public hearings. But, you know, one of the things I just wanted to point out, because we were talking about it in the last uh, segment, and you mentioned how these high-level intelligence people are talking. I think it, that's part of pushback. I mean, I, in the last year, basically, uh, two heads of the CIA and one head of the uh, director of national intelligence have spoken out about this. And I'll do this very fast, George, but I just think it's kind of important. Uh, we've had somebody speak from the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, and the Trump administration, and I'm just going to give a taste, all right? The Trump administration was DNI John Ratcliffe, who said we have multiple sensors that have been picking up these things. Some of these are unexplained phenomenon, and there's actually quite a few more that have been made public. Obama's CIA director, John Brennan, said, I think some of the phenomenon we're seeing uh, continue to be unexplained and might, in fact, be some type of phenomenon that is the result of something that we don't yet understand. And wait for it, folks. And that could involve some type of activity that some might say constitutes a different form of life. That's coming from a CIA director. Clinton CIA director James Woolsey said in the middle of an interview, well, there was one case in which a friend of mine was able to have his aircraft stop at 40,000 feet or so and not continue operating as a normal aircraft. What was going on? I don't know. Does anybody know? So I guess what I'm saying is I think the pushback uh, doesn't have to come just from our elected representatives who are sitting in closed-door uh, meetings in Congress. Uh, these guys that spoke out had the, the highest uh, level of security that we offer I, I, at least I think, uh, for CIA and D, DNI, and they're speaking out about this thing. So I think there are a lot of people who do want to talk about this, and we are getting closer and closer to the day where uh, somebody says something uh, that, that opens the door a little bit more than can't be ignored. I, I really don't think those comments can be ignored, and, and hopefully some, but some mainstream journalists might write an article about all these intelligence <laughs> people who are doing it. But listen— um, we have work to do. We're not there, uh, but we are further along than we, we ever were, and we seem to be moving in the right direction. So when you talk about, like, uh, John Brennan and, and Woolsey, yeah. those guys come forward, make these astonishing statements. Did they know before and then lie about it or just ignore the topic, or did they not know, really, and pay no attention it while they were at the top of their agencies and only got a briefing later when all those stuff broke out in the news media? What do you think? Well, it's interesting. I, I think they knew. If, if you listen to their 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 quotes, it almost sounds like uh, they didn't get the the full briefing, and that they're just sort of now that they're out of office, they're talking about what they did hear about. And uh, so, whether they know the final truth or not, it seems unlikely. But they certainly know that something is going on. So, well, Ross, yeah. you think they knew? I do, George. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, I've been having conversations on exactly this issue. I was asking somebody in a position to know uh, presidents briefed, and um, I was interested. I was trying to find out why Obama has suddenly taken such a close interest. And uh, I've heard different stories. One is that he wasn't briefed while he was president, but he has been briefed after he became president because presidents, as you know, are allowed to get top secret briefings. They continue to get briefings on national security issues after they leave office. And then with various CIA directors and various heads of departments, it all boils down to who you are. Um, I mean, there is a cadre of people. I know this sounds like paranoid conspiracy theory nonsense, but there really is a cadre of people whom I think are invested with the knowledge. It's been very carefully kept. And let me devil's advocate for a moment. I'm not the sort of journalist who dismisses out of hand the idea that things need to be protected for reasons of national security. Let's assume just for a moment that it's true what the New York Times has written about, that there are retrieved non-human technologies in the possession of the United States. I would hope and I would expect that the United States government would do its level best to achieve military superiority 
strategic superiority over any potential enemy by developing that technology, by back engineering it, and by understanding it. And I would keep it secret as long as possible, as long as I could. And when it came to a confrontation with a potential enemy, as sadly we we do face with both Russia and China at the moment, both of our countries, I would hope that they'd pull this out of a hat. So the best possible spin that I can put on this is that there is a very good reason for why the United States might be sitting on this issue, why it might be concealing it, uh, because it basically wants to not show its hand. What I don't understand is there's a difference between acknowledging a non-human intelligence on this planet and then acknowledging recovered technology. You can do one without acknowledging the other. And that's what I think we should see. That's my prediction for 2023. My hope is that we will see some concession from the government that this isn't just anomalous technology in our atmosphere and in orbit and underwater, that whatever this is, it's not human. Ross, let me jump in here and and just ask you to expound on one thing here. The, the, The idea that Barack Obama would not be briefed on this incredible topic while he was president, but then would be briefed on the big secret afterwards just doesn't make sense to me. Why why would uh, any rational national security policy say, let's brief the guy about the big secret after he's out of office? Why would they do that? That's a bloody good question, Bryce, but I'm told that's the situation, and it's all about need to know. Well, Literally, I think I think there are I think there are some people in the national security establishment in America who lost sight during the Cold War of who runs the government. The people listening to this audio run the government. It's government of the people, for the people, by the people. I studied your constitution in my law school. One of the things I think is great about America is it enshrines in its constitution the government is the people. You the people, the American people, have the right. You own this country. It's yours. And sadly, what I think has happened is over the years, especially during the confrontations of the Cold War, a lot was done in the name of national security to suppress things that ought properly to be oversighted by the American people. And I think they have been kept from the Congress. And that's why we're seeing momentum now in the Congress, albeit begrudgingly by the Pentagon and the intelligence community, they are asking hard questions. The only question in my mind, though, is, okay, let's say they do do a briefing to a top Senate Intelligence Committee team or to the Armed Services Committee. Let's say that's all done in a secure skiff in a top secret way. Will the public be told? Should the public be told? I I worry that, yes, the Congress will get briefed, but I suspect that they may cop the line from the military, oh, yes, we can't reveal a lot of this stuff for national security reasons, and, um, you know, it's important that the public not be told the full story. I think that's already true. I think that's already happened, and that there have been briefings of that nature behind closed doors in a classified sort of setting, and that some pretty amazing information has been shared it's happened already, and we haven't heard a peep about it, and I'm not sure we would. Here's my question to you. Let's say that the, that the Congress gets told behind closed doors that the crash retrievals are real, that we've recovered these materials, it's not just uh, bits and pieces of scattered metal, but entire craft and maybe bodies, and that uh, you know they demand some information about where it is. Maybe a delegation goes to take a look at it. Does that answer the big questions? I'll ask you first, Bryce, and then you, Ross. Does it does it tell us where they're from, why they're here, what their interest is in us, or is it still uh, going to be a mystery after that information gets known by some within the government? <laughs> well, I, I don't think we probably know everything about it. Uh, I do think uh, if I was going to make a prediction for 2023, um, I think it's possible that we are going to have the acknowledgement of crash retrieval. Uh, your question, and that would be the sort of the game changer that sort of breaks down the, this wall of silence. Because yeah. if you're going to acknowledge crashes, you're you you got to talk about all kinds of other things. I guess if the question is what, do, here's the problem. I believe the government has learned a lot about this over the years, and they just don't share their work. I mean, that's been the policy since the beginning, and I 
I think that what we're looking for in the future is to get the government to the place where and I agree with Ross. You don't have to brief us on national security issues, and there's always room for some classified stuff. But it is time to share their work and at least tell us what their best guess is, because, the, gentlemen, the, the truth is between the three of us, the three amigos here tonight, none of us have, you know, actually know what is going on. And there are people inside this discovery process who have better theories than we do because they're working with better data. And so that's going to be what happens in the future is the data increases, the theories get better, and then we begin to work together to try to figure out what this is. And that's what I look forward to as the forward progress of 2023 into 2024. Totally agree. Bryce Zabel, Ross Coltart are my guests. We'll open up the phone lines in the next segment so you can get into this conversation as well. It sort of uh, goes to the kind of uh, perspective that you have. Is it optimistic or pessimistic? You know, with that UAP task force uh, re- prepared a report for Congress dating back to 2004, 144 UFO cases that have been investigated. And of the 144, 143 were unexplained unidentified. And it wasn't just because they didn't have enough information. In fact, you look back at the the history of the UFO topic, sometimes the best cases, the ones you have more information about are the least explainable. Just having more info doesn't mean you automatically explain it. The more info you have in some of them, the less you know, uh, because it doesn't fit any known phenomena. So, uh, you know, the question is what this next report might be. Uh, We already know, based on the reports of Friday's event, that hundreds of additional cases have come forward to Arrow, the current UFO organization the Pentagon is investigating through, and uh, hundreds of those coming in from military witnesses and others. It's going to be hard to explain those away. Uh, I I think that there are a lot of investigators working on this problem who are honest and really do want to get to the bottom of it and not cover it up, while there are also people who would like it to all go away. My guests, uh, Bryce Zabel, Ross Coltart, are here for one more segment. We'll take some of your calls and see what else is on you know, the minds of our listeners here on Coast. We'll be right back. Two world-class journalists who cover the UFO subject in detail, Bryce Zabel, Ross Coltart, are my guests tonight. Their podcast called Need to Know is terrific. You should check it out. If you haven't seen it before, you could review the 25 episodes they produced this year. It's good stuff. Let's go to the phone and see what's on the minds of our listeners tonight. East of the Rockies, Patrick in Southern Maryland. Hi, Patrick. You're on with Bryce and Ross. Hi, guys. Thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to say real quick, um, Bryce and Ross, I've watched every single one of your uh, episodes. Thank you very much for doing it. Uh, uh, I love watching uh, an episode when it's put out. And also, George, thank you for for what you do. My question is... uh, to Bryce and Ross, let's say hypothetically you guys get read in one day, right, and you get all the answers to the questions that you've ever asked, and you come to the conclusion that um, the government has been suppressing what they know about UFOs and the phenomena, et cetera, for benevolent reasons, and you agree, um, would that change what you do? Would it change what you report or what you say? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this is Bryce. I'll, I'll jump in. I, I don't have to be read in to favor uh, some more transparency on this. I'm not saying that I uh, am, am uh, comfortable with what might be revealed. We don't really know at this point. It might be a threat. It might have a downside. But I just think it's gone on long enough, and what is it's time uh, to, to, to see happen is that we – own up to it because at the end of the day, all of us together are smarter than just a few of us. And if we want to get to the real bottom of what this mystery is all about, we're going to have to own up to it and let the world get to work on it. So I, I'm not the young man I used to be, so I'm eager to see us get on with that in my lifetime because I'd like to, uh, I'd like to know, I need to know. And, uh, and by the way, thank you for all the co- nice comments about need to know. And if people want to hear any of those 25 episodes it's need to know dot today so thank you i'll just add to that i mean i i I think if i'm read in i'm basically agreeing to what security and intelligence officials would require to be read into anything especially something like compartmentalized top secret intelligence 
which of course is never going to happen to a journalist. But to be read in, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. You have to essentially agree not to publish certain things. Now, I would never do that. No journalist should or would ever agree to such a deal. Um, the, the closest I've ever come is when I was embedded with American troops uh, in combat zones in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And you'd sign this massive document that basically undertook that you would check first before you publish anything to make sure that you weren't compromising the safety of American soldiers or operational issues. I have no issue with that at all. If you're going to embed or work with military forces, you don't want to compromise their safety. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think a ready, a ready in situation would ever occur for a journo. I, I could just never agree to that. Thanks for the call. Go ahead. Hey, George, go ahead. I just wanted to point out that, and, and we don't need to go all into it, but back uh, when I was doing Dark Skies, a couple of guys did show up uh, at, at the Dark Skies offices and, in essence, offer, I guess, a limited, modified reading in of something because they wanted to give us information that we would put into the Dark Skies program. And um, I didn't take that opportunity then, and you know, I don't know that I would now. Thanks, uh, Patrick, for the call. West of the Rockies, Joe in Montana. Hi, Joe. What's on your mind? Hi, uh, George. Uh, I, I just called in because I wanted to let you know that I was offered a job in our UFO program in the United States. Uh, and, by whom? And what did they say? Hey, we got a UFO program. Man, you want to work for it? No, I had known him while I was in the service. We were both flying F-4 Phantoms uh, together in the service. I got out and flew for the airlines, and he stayed in government service and ended up being the assistant director of the CIA in the Foreign Intelligence Division. Wow. And I don't think I should probably say his name or my name, but when I was working in the cursor to the UFO program, which they have, it's kind of a magic program that has all sorts of different things where we have specialized vehicles. We had a, the normal secrecy channels, and we also had to sign a 20-year secrecy agreement, and it was renewable um, every 20 years. And that's when I was contacted about coming into the UFO program was on the first anniversary of when I'd left the other program. Was this at Los Alamos? For the airline for 20 was, years. Is that Los Alamos Lab? Right. Um, hmm. Did they tell you what you would do? Yes, I, I would. I would have been doing things very similar to what Bob Lazar was doing. Tell you what, Joe, uh, you don't want to give these names out uh, on the air, but if you wouldn't mind hanging on and, and speaking to my gal Donna there, I'd, I would like to reach out and continue the conversation, okay? Yeah, I'll be glad to do that. Okay. I mean, hey, I know that everything— can I, ask you a, can I ask you a question, Joe? Uh, forgive me for interrupting. It's Ross Coulthard here. I, I've spoken to other people like your good self. Can I ask you this, sir? If, if you had joined— the program, and I know people who have, and they're loyal, good, patriotic Americans, and they do question the level of secrecy that's attached to the technology that they're aware of. If you'd become aware, let's say you'd been briefed into a program to develop anti-gravity, and you were aware that, that, that as, as has been put to me, good science is being hindered by excessive secrecy. Would you feel okay about testifying to Congress? Would, would, how, how would you feel as somebody who's stooped in that security world about coming forward and testifying? Well, I believe that we should all feel free enough to try to advance the human race. But if you signed a secrecy, uh, a secrecy agreement that is a top secret code word above top secret, um, you're really precluded from from saying anything, and so therefore and that, you, you probably can't, unless you want to so say special. whatever. That's what's so special about this legislation. Are. Right. Yeah, because it's it's good men like yourself who are now faced with this dilemma because the legislation allows the top secret compartmentalized intelligence a gag on you speaking to be overruled by the, the imperative that the Congress be properly informed. 
So you are given protections. Everybody in the program is given protections under these excellent new laws, not as excellent as they could have been. But what Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo have achieved by pushing for these laws in the Congress is really quite momentous because people with these gags, these national security prohibitions, are now able to come forward. And that's what's so exciting. Joe, thanks for the call. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, Donna will get some information, and uh, maybe you can, you and I can continue to talk later. Uh, we're going to the wild card line. Uh, Brendan in Austin. Hi, Brendan. You're on with Bryce and Ross. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Appreciate it. So I just wanted to say uh, for anybody who hasn't already, you need to sign up for Mystery Wire podcast for anywhere that you haven't already. And uh, also wanted to say that for any truckers who have been shown anything or seen anything for underground bases or any bases to contact people at Mystery Wire and tell them your experiences. And the reason I was calling, oh, one more thing super quick. I have a quick theory. The reason we have, they have lights on the UAPs maybe is because that they use AI to measure the distance between the lights so that they can fly really quickly in formation. That was just an idea. But the reason I was calling was because uh, when Snowden, Edward Snowden had released his documents, there was documents in there that were about um, the FBI that had images that had been debunked of UAPs and UFOs and stuff like that. So you know, we're talking about pushback. And I was saying, if you go back to the uh, to the files with Edward Snowden, there was Push back with the FBI all the way back then. And uh, we didn't get the full things. We just got the images. But I encourage everybody to look that up. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brendan. Do either of you know of, uh, I, I don't recall what, what uh, might have been in the Snowden documents about UFO, UAP. Do either of you know? I, I do as not. far as I know, he, he said publicly that um, he looked but didn't find anything. And he, he strongly doubted that there was anything there because he had. Uh, super user access to the uh, the systems of the NSA, and and he says he actively looked for documents inside the NSA that would link to UFOs, and he actually came away skeptical that there were such documents because he well, couldn't that, find them. Well, he didn't that find the OSAP was... documents. Uh, I guess the DIA didn't share them with NSA then because they were real. There was there was a bunch of them. What were you going to say, Bryce? I was just going to say that's how I, uh, I, I as as Ross was saying that I, that's how I remember the story. I, and uh, I was hoping at the time that he would have found something, but I don't think he did. We're going to Bill in Los Angeles. Hey, Bill, how you doing? We're on with Bryce and Ross. And guess, uh, George, you rightly criticized the Washington Post's scant coverage of UAPs of late. Uh, and as a former uh, mainstream newspaper writer myself, I'd like to note, to, just to balance that, that the Washington Post headline on July 28, 1952, was uh, approximately, quote, Air Force jets chase saucers over capital, unquote. That's, that's how far they've, they've you know, swallowed the, the government line since then. And I, I'd just like to add that uh, I think there's enough objective empirical evidence and professional witnesses such that we don't need the current lab dog media clowns or their government masters like CIA directors, of all people, to conclude that transmedium aircraft doing 58,000 miles per hour in 2004 ain't from our neighborhood. <laughs> That's I agree with that. Absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all on the same page on that, uh, Bill. I, I was also point out the Washington Post had a great story in the 70s about those overflights over the nuclear bases. Uh, they, they broke a story based on FOIA documents, I think, about the these nuclear bases on the U.S.-Canadian border that were visited by UFOs one after another over a couple-week period. So they have done some good stories over the years, but in general, they're pretty hostile. Thanks for the George, call. In, in 2010, when there was the uh, National Press Club uh, conference where they talked about the uh, overflights at nuclear uh, bases, uh, the Washington Post sent a lifestyle reporter to cover it, and he began his report by talking about the chocolate chip cookies that were served at the press club. Yeah, that's the good stuff. I, I tell you what, there's a there's a book by the late Terry Hansen. It's called The Missing Times. Anyone who's yep. interested in the UFO topic or media and how news media have covered this over the years and, and want to know if they've been complacent or complicit in the cover-up, 
That book is terrific. You can find it. It's uh, not out of print. You can find it on, on Amazon and a couple other places, so check that out. Try to get one more call in. We're going to South Carolina. Barry, old buddy, old pal, how you doing? Hey. <laughs> hey, George. Yes. So oh, this is Cornelius in Alexandria. I see. I was going to Barry in South oh, Carolina. I we'll go to Barry. <laughs> okay. Uh, have we got Barry on the line? It's still Cornelius. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Cornelius. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I want to, okay, uh, Bryce and Ross, we got about two minutes left or so. You guys want to talk about anything else uh, that might be coming down the line, what you're looking for in 2023? Uh, Bryce? Well, I, I think 2023, uh, if, I think I'm speaking for the three of us, that all of us have our own uh, confidential sources, some of which may overlap, although we don't know. But I, they all seem to be talking about crash wreckage. Uh, something Ross and I have discussed. So I actually think that crash wreckage probably is what many of those closed door hearings have been talking about. And uh, I, I, I look forward in 2023 to possibly seeing that. But I just wanted to end by just saying we never really talked about all the things that happened in 2022. Here's a quick run. We had the May 17th hearing, which was the congressional hearing. Um, we have a NASA investigation, which began this year. We have the October 31st non-report that is about to become a report, and we have the National Defense um, uh, Act uh, language put in. Uh, we even had uh, Elizondo declaring that ufology must die. So it was a busy year. And uh, I look NASA to busy year next year. Yeah, NASA got involved too, and and you know yeah. there's another big development. Ryan Graves is heading up an investigation on behalf of the AIAA that I think could be as big as any of these things. Uh, Ross, I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the commercial pilots, our friend Ben Hansen, has done some fantastic work this year that should be acknowledged on the or continuing reports of commercial pilots who are seeing <clears throat> anomalous objects. And despite the debunkers gloriously tying themselves in knots to try and shoot it all down, the simple fact is they're still unexplained. And the other favourite of mine is um, the ongoing revelations about those strange objects that stalked U.S. warships off the coast of Southern California in 2019. They tried to call them Chinese drones. That explanation didn't wash. Ron Moultrie didn't even try that one again this time in the uh, press briefing last week. But the simple fact is that the documents that have been re revealed by, for example, the Drive and the great work done by Jeremy Corbell, there's objects hovering and flying near Navy vessels that sparked a huge investigation. The Navy investigated it. It wasn't civilian activity. It wasn't U.S. military operations. There's only two possibilities. Either it's a foreign adversary or it's something else. <laughs> All right. Uh, on that, we'll end. Ross Coltart, Bryce Zabel, thank you guys so much. Need to know. If folks haven't heard it, they need to check it out. And uh, please keep me in the loop, fellas. It's been George. a pleasure, George. George. Thanks for having us. All right, we'll talk to you again. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.